Well, hello and welcome back to the History of the Restoration Movement PowerPoint Archives. This is module number seven, and in this module we will discuss ecstatic religion, and specifically ecstatic religion as it uh, applies to Christianity. Um, ecstatic religion will come in many shapes and sizes in and throughout the history of Christianity, but we want to specifically look at a set of circumstances that took place in 1801, known as the Cane Ridge Revival. And we want to look at how this could possibly be interpreted as an ecstatic religious experience. So, I'd like to begin by asking the question, potentially, what do all of these pictures have in common? There's a lot going on here, but let's start with the upper left and work our way around. In the top, we have a charismatic, or even, or some would even call it a Pentecostal Roman Catholic Mass happening in Jamaica. Notice here that we see many of the things that you would expect to see in a Pentecostal service. Raising of hands, a more exuberant time of praise and worship, but we also see many of the other classic Catholic accoutrements as well. We see the raising of the golden cross and procession of the bread and wine elements. We see the use of robes and other liturgical vestments. We see a cloud of smoke coming up from behind the celebrant, suggesting that they are burning incense. All very classically Catholic things. And yet, in the midst of this, we see this kind of Pentecostalism meshed right in between there. Hold that idea in your mind for a second. Because below we have something from about five centuries earlier. Below that we have a picture of Saint Teresa of Avila. She is a Carmelite nun who lived in Spain. And as this picture shows, she is writing in her book and she is being visited by the Holy Spirit. Teresa was known for having what are called ecstatic experiences. And by that, she would often go into um, trances, that she would claim that she saw visions from heaven, and, in my opinion, wrote some of the most beautiful poetry coming out of the Latin church during this century. And all of this just want to pave the way for the understanding that ecstatic religion has been with Catholicism for a long while. And that even in certain places like in Jamaica in our upper picture, it still has a prevalence in Roman Catholicism. Now, shifting gears, let's look at the bottom middle picture. Here we have the Kansas City Chiefs, and they are doing their pre-game huddle. Now, I could have possibly picked a better team, but I think the fact that it's the Kansas City Chiefs doing this, I think, better illustrates my point. When you aren't the best team in the world, as you look in the background of that picture and you see that there's maybe, what, five, six hundred people in the stands, it looks like. How do you psych yourself up? How do you get into the zone to play at the professional level? And the answer to that is you have a pregame ritual where you say uh, particular things that the team knows what to expect. You do certain physical activities often very high-stress activities, and the result is you're in the zone. And many people who are writing from a secular perspective would also note that this is a form of ecstaticism. Now, continuing on, to the bottom left, or sorry, the bottom right, we have a snake-handling Pentecostal church. Here is a young man handling what looks to be about three or four poisonous snakes. And they are doing this as a part of their normal Sunday worship. Now, 
while this seems extremely bizarre to most of us, um, anyone who comes from a snake handling background would simply point you to the last chapter of Mark and point out how, according to Mark's longer ending, that Jesus is quoted as saying that the disciples will perform many kinds of signs and wonders. And in that list is that they will pick up tongue they sorry they will pick up snakes and if they are bitten they will not be harmed and so in many of these pentecostal type uh, churches in the appalachians we see this snake handling tendency and it's prevalent even today now above we see a i guess more classically pentecostal service in the philippines and again, just kind of bringing this full circle, we see arms raised. We see most of the participants, most of whom seem to be women, but we see most of these participants lost in their moment of worship. And I, what I'd like to suggest here is that ecstaticism, ecstatic religion, even when it comes from a secular source like, say, our Kansas City Chiefs, huddle warm up. What we are dealing with is a something that can be produced within a human being. It does not necessarily have to have a spiritual origin. But you notice how difficult it is to say, well, that's spiritual on one side, but the other ones aren't. To be honest, I think you could make an argument that in all five of these cases, we have a certain amount of spirituality happen. And so, a static religion brings up a fundamental question. Where does it come from? What causes a static religion? So, real quick here before I lose you, though, I do want to say just right off the top, that this is not anything to do with the drug ecstasy. Ecstatic religion, while it can have um, its root in drug usage, for the most part, ecstatic religion does not involve any kind of psychoreactive drugs. And so, I will just say, along with the creators of South Park, Drugs are bad, and this lecture is not about ecstasy. So, let's try to come up with a definition here. What is an ecstasy, or what is a religious ecstasy, to be specific? Well, some of the more simple definitions would be to call it an emotional state that is so intense that a person is carried beyond rational thought or even self-control. And I'd like to point out that most religions, including Judaism and Christianity, can provide examples of a static religion. Ecstasies are extremely common in Hindu rituals. They are slightly less common in Buddhism. But even in classic monotheisms, for example, in Islam, we can uh, cite groups such as the whirling dervishes that spin themselves around until they enter a trance-like state. We can point out numerous Christian groups, like we had on the previous slides here, of our snake handling church, uh, Teresa of Avila, and many other Christians who entered into these ecstatic states where they were carried beyond rational thought or self-control. And so, one of the questions is, well, what causes an ecstatic state? And the answer to this is, it can be brought about by quite a few things. Um, prayer, music, prophecy, meditation and rituals, drugs, spiritual possession, and just for a caveat, I'll just say, unexplained other phenomena. Some ecstasies really lack a solid basis for saying what caused it. And so then the next question that obviously comes up is, well, is there a biblical example 
of a static religion. And I'm going to really plow a median through this. I'm going to say that in some ways yes and in some ways no. I will stress that there are quite a number of biblical scholars, particularly Old Testament scholars, who will really drive this point home that, for example, Leon J. Wood in his book, The Prophets of Israel, really focuses on this thesis that whatever is happening in Jewish religion, it has nothing to do with ecstatic religion. That that is something those pagans do. Meanwhile, we'll have other people like, for example, John Walton, who will say in his books that ecstaticism is just a common part of the ancient Near Eastern religion experience. And the Jewish people had ecstatic experiences. So, here are some possible examples that could fall under the umbrella of a static religion. And again, that umbrella being loosely defined as an emotional state where one is carried beyond rational thought or self-control. For example, uh, King Saul in 1 Samuel 10, he's out to kill David. He heads up towards uh, Gibeah, and a group of prophets meet him playing music and prophesying. Saul falls down onto the ground, somehow strips out of his clothing, and simply lays there all night. And this gives David a chance to escape. So, whatever happened to Saul, it certainly carried him beyond his own ability to control himself. Another possible example uh, could be Daniel. In Daniel chapter 9, Daniel gives a very extended prayer uh, concerning Jerusalem, concerning the future of the Jewish people and the temple. And when he is done, he is going to have a series of visions where an angel will meet up with him and will explain to him things that must happen in the future. Now, did his prayer help bring about this vision? Are the prayer and the vision somehow interconnected? It's hard to say. Another example of similar nature might be Isaiah in the book of Isaiah chapter 6 verses 1 through 8. Isaiah is going about his priestly duties and he sees in the temple the Lord high and lifted up, the angels flying around saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. All of this I just want to point out that these examples from the Old Testament may indicate that from time to time, God's prophets, while they are in the process of receiving revelation, while they are receiving a divine communication from God, may be carried into a state that, they are, that is somehow beyond rational thought or beyond the prophet's sense of self-control. For another musical example, Elisha in 2 Kings chapter 3 will call for a uh, instrumentalist, a harp player, to come before him. And as the player plays, he will suddenly prophesy. Brings about an interesting question. Why did he need music to prophesy? Clearly, he has prophesied other things before, why is music necessary then? Now, this is not just limited to the Old Testament. We could find several examples in the New Testament. For example, John in the Revelation um, describes his um, encounter with the risen Christ. He says in um, chapter 1, verse 10, he says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. What does it mean to be in the Spirit? How, what, what was John experiencing? I don't really know, but he describes it in very apocalyptic terms. He sees visions. He is feeling himself even bodily transported. Now compare that to what the uh, apostles experience in Acts chapter 2. Again, they are in a moment of prayer. There is this sound of a rushing wind. 
they see these tongues of fire, as they're described, landing upon their heads. And they suddenly burst into this otherworldly language. It is described that when they go out into the streets preaching the gospel, that other people of different tongues will hear their language. Now, there is a speaking component, and there is possibly a hearing component with this miracle. But notice how the apostles really don't seem to have a high degree of self-control over this event. And even more so, that the onlookers are starting to ask the question, is this an example of public drunkenness? And so, wrap this whole thing up in a bow, I would just like to say, ecstatic religion, at least under a very broad definition of an emotional state that carries a person beyond rational thought or self-control, does seem to exist in the New Testament and in the Old. Now, we could probably look at dozens of scriptural texts to describe spiritual gifts, to describe their usage, their maintenance, but I'd like to point out that there is also a, probably a greater issue that will come up and will lead directly into one of the problems we will experience in our study today, is how do you tell the real thing? How do you tell a spiritual experience one that is actually prompted and motivated by God, versus a counterfeit. And this, I, I think this, this will be important because, as we pointed out with our Kansas City Chiefs um, moment of warm-up, it does not necessarily have to be religion or an encounter with the living God that causes an ecstatic state. And so I'd like to look at several passages that may have some degree of bearing on this topic. The first one is in 1 John chapter 4. John the Elder writes, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to determine if they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you will know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses Jesus Christ, or sorry, Jesus as the Christ, who has come in the flesh, that is from God. So, note how John puts this. He doesn't say whether these prophets are causing any kind of miracle, but the context seems to suggest that there's at least something spiritual going on with these false prophets that could cause a believer to go in the wrong direction. And so, for John, his litmus test for true prophecy is going to be the Christology of the message of the prophet. He is going to specifically say, if you want to know if it's from God, do they confess that Jesus is the Christ? And specifically, do they confess that he has come in the flesh? Meaning, does, are they teaching that Christ has a body? And so, notice here that John divorces the prophet entirely from any spiritual work that he specifically says, if you want to know the real deal, part of it comes down to the message. Does it confess Jesus as the Christ? Does it confess Jesus had flesh, or did he come in a body? And let's look at an Old Testament example here to further bolster that idea. In Deuteronomy 13, we see Moses writing this. Suppose a prophet or one who foretells by dreams should appear among you and show you a sign or a wonder. And the sign or wonder should come to pass concerning what he said to you, namely, let us follow other gods, gods whom you have not yet previously known, and let us serve them. You must not listen to the words of that prophet or dreamer, for the Lord your God will be testing you to see if you love him with all your heart, all your mind, and all your being. So notice, 
Moses has a very similar message that we saw John the Elder having. He assumes that a false prophet can produce some kind of sign. Now, what kind of sign are we talking about? It doesn't say. It just says sign or wonder. But I'd probably be willing to go out on a limb here that probably part of what the false prophet is producing looks at least somewhat on the outside similar to what a real prophet is producing. And so once again, Moses' litmus test for discerning good message, bad message, is not the sign or wonder. It's the content of the message itself. And in this case, Moses is warning, don't follow other gods whom you have not previously known. Do not serve them. Basically, it's a defense of monotheism. If a prophet comes up, even if they've got the goods on the signs wonders department, if the message goes against monotheism and leads you to following other gods, that message is not from the Lord. And it's interesting that he says, because the Lord your God is testing you to see if you love him. And so, quite possibly, this could be an example of what is known as God's permissive will, that God is even permitting this false prophet to display a certain amount of supernatural power in order to allow uh, for this test to happen. All right, so let's shift gears back to the New Testament here. Here we're going to see Paul in his letter to the Corinthians. And in chapter 12, he is going to give a list of both miraculous gifts and we'll call them positional gifts or gifts of office. Now, Note his logic here, and I'm using the NET because I think it really captures the way that the question should be asked here. Paul writes, And God has placed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, gifts of healing, helps, gifts of leadership, different kinds of tongues. Not all are apostles, are they? Not all are prophets, are they? Not all our teachers, are they? Not all perform miracles, do they? Not all have gifts of healing, do they? Not all speak in tongues, do they? Not all interpret, do they? But you should be eager for the greater gifts. Now, again, I like this this translation because it asks all of these questions the way that I think Paul was trying to address it. Not everybody gets to be an apostle. Not everybody gets to be a prophet. Not everybody gets to be a teacher. And so, from this perspective, it at least lets me know that a person with the Holy Spirit will not have the entire spectrum of miraculous signs and gifts at their disposal. Interestingly, Paul says you should be eager for the greater gifts. That you should rightly pray for them and in some ways even ask that these greater gifts be given to you. So he doesn't uh, rule out the possibility that if you don't do one of these things, that it may not happen. But he does seem to have it just as a baseline understanding that not everybody is going to display these phenomenon, at least across the board. And then a last one. Here is Peter's first sermon, as we have already alluded to. But let us look at Peter's defense of the ecstatic experiences this uh, that happened at first Pentecost. But Peter stood up with the eleven, and he raised his voice, and he addressed them, and he said, Men of Judea! And all who live in Jerusalem, know this and listen carefully to what I say. In spite of what you think, these men are not drunk, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. But this is what was spoken about through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it will be, God says, that I will pour out my Spirit on all people. 
And your sons and daughters will prophesy, and your young men will see visions, and your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy, and will perform wonders in the skies above, miraculous signs in the earth below, blood and fire and the clouds of smoke. The sun will be changed to darkness, and the moon to blood, before the great and glorious day that the Lord comes. Now, if I could sum up some of those points there, I'd just like to say, number one, Peter first has to defend that some of these spiritual gifts can be mistaken for a very common human phenomenon, drunkenness, specifically public drunkenness, and that he has to basically say, no, no, this isn't drunkenness. But he then goes on to say that these pouring out of the Spirit will first, he makes it pretty global, that it will be on the sons and daughters, even the old men and the young, and I'm assuming uh, the young women, or the older women as well. And then he will go on to say that they will perform signs and wonders. And quite frankly, the, the descriptions that he gives here are extremely po apocalyptic. Blood and fire and clouds of smoke sun changed to darkness, moon to blood. These are all extremely, we'll call them almost astrological signs, that they are signs that would only manifest in the natural world and specifically in the heavens. So for Peter, he's not even ruling out the possibility that these ecstatic things, besides just applying to the body, could apply to a wider range of miracle. So, let's talk some conclusions then. Because a class on the doctrine of the Holy Spirit and on miracles could, quite frankly, take up an entire semester all of its own. And I dare say this class, that's, that kind of class would probably be more provocative than anything you're going to get in a history of the Restoration Movement. But I would like to look at these scriptures that we looked at and make a few generic statements about spiritual power as it is presented in the Bible. For starters, it is just simply taken for granted in the biblical world, both in the New and Old Testaments, that miraculous power exists. And that spirits and the Spirit of God are very real. Now, the only reason I bring this up is that as we live in a post-Enlightenment era, post-1700s, it is almost taken for granted by most of the Western population that miracles may actually just be human beings being silly. That miracles may not exist. And so I would just like to point out that the biblical world if you follow a biblical worldview, does just kind of assume across the board miracles exist and that the Spirit of God and the power from God is very real. But to temper that claim, I would also like to point out Paul's admonition that he says, not every believer has access to the complete line of gifts. And you know, if somebody has the gifts of helps, which was on Paul's list, you very well could have a spiritual gift that would have absolutely no miraculous manifestation, ecstatic or otherwise. And just to bring this full circle, I'd also like to point out that both Moses and John affirm that there is such a thing as a counterfeit, that both prophecy and miracles, or signs and wonders, can be made and fabricated by a false prophet. And in those cases that both John and Moses assume that a spiritually discerning person would know the difference. That they would base the content of the message and not on the miracle itself, as whether or not this was something they should follow. Now, this of course leads us to a pretty profound conundrum today. Because many religious groups, not just Christians, 
claim that they have access to divine power. That a spiritual leading is in their religion, in their denomination, and other people may not have that. And that brings up a very interesting question. How do you tell the difference? How do you tell a genuine movement of the Spirit of God versus a fabrication? And part of the reason I bring this up is because throughout the course of the Restoration Movement, in 1801, this happened. And we would call it the Great Western Revival. Now, this is actually not a picture of the Cane Ridge Revival of 1801. This is actually a later Methodist Revival. But I like this picture because it demonstrates several things that are very common to frontier revivals. Number one, notice the people that we see some people standing looking somewhat flabbergasted at what they're seeing. That some people are looking on with just incredible disinterest. But right here in the middle, we see people lying on the ground, people swooning back and forth, people crying with their heads bowed in prayer. That in the frontier revivals, we're going to see some very, very weird manifestations. And part of the historian's job is to ask the question, where did these manifestations come from? What caused them to come into being? And before we tackle that, look at some of these other aspects of this revival from this picture. One, notice in the very far background we see tents, these little triangular things rising up in the distance. These are people that actually will travel a distance to see this event or spectacle. Now notice that there's a wooden pavilion there, kind of front and center, where a man is preaching, and it looks like several other men are on deck to preach. All of this to say, for being the middle of nowhere, <clears throat> this is a highly communal event, this is a highly social event. And this is also a profoundly uh, intense event. I don't yet want to say that it was ecstaticism because not every revival had these kind of ecstatic moments. But they certainly did seem to manifest from time to time. So, let us actually look at some of the weird things that happened from Cane Ridge. Now, one of our best sources for Cane Ridge is in Barton W. Stone's biography. Now, Barton W. Stone spends a great deal of time in his biography describing this, and so I've purposely chosen to abridge his descriptions by using our textbook by James North as kind of a guide to really kind of summarize some of these exercises, as he called them. Now, by far the most prevalent, and in my opinion, possibly the, the one exercise that has the most in common with what we would in modern Protestant circles call Pentecostalism, is this experience that they call the falling exercise. Here is the way Stone refers to it. He would say, A person fell, often with a piercing scream, and lay there unconscious for some time. And then, when they came to, would begin relating his love for Jesus and urging the hearers to repentance. Let's run some of these things through our four texts that we looked at. Number one, these people are not denying Jesus. So, at least from the point of view of John the Elder, we don't have a denial of Jesus, although we don't know for certain whether they were having as part of their Jesus proclamation that Jesus is the Christ or that Jesus came in the flesh. But they are certainly urging people to repentance, which is a New Testament concept. 
Now, you notice in all of the descriptions of miracles that Paul gave in 1 Corinthians, or in the description that we saw in Acts chapter 2, we don't see this falling, or this, I guess for lack of a better word, passing out. Um, and so, whatever this experience is, it does not have a New Testament precedent. But that being said, um, that has not stopped many Christians throughout the centuries of claiming something was from God, not having New Testament precedent. But to me, it is very interesting that this falling exercise does not have a clear New Testament precedent. Now, moving on to probably a more unique, or I'll even say weird, exercise is this thing called the jerking exercise, or often just referred to as the jerks. Here's what Stone describes it as. He says, the people were often seized by a series of jerks, these violent muscular convulsions. People attest, or sorry, stories attest of people standing flat-footed on the ground with their whole body jerking back and forth. Documented stories exist of women with long hair jerking so violently that at the end of their jerk, their hair made the exact sound of a bullwhip being snapped. Stone also gives an interesting description of a jerk, a man that was jerking so uh, acrobatically that while remaining flat footed, his forehead would almost touch the ground. And then he would snap back so that almost the back of his head would touch the ground but he would never stop being flat-footed. Now, that requires an amazing amount of upper body strength. Again, the jerking exercise doesn't have, at least of its own accord, a, um, anything that is proclamation. Uh, that a person could be described as having a jerking, a, the jerking exercise and not proclaim anything about Jesus. So, in the test that John and Moses give, we really can't say that it is accompanied by a false proclamation of the gospel, at least from the person experiencing the exercise. We also cannot say as per uh, what we looked at in Acts or Corinthians, that this jerking exercise has a New Testament precedent. And following that up, we find this other exercise that's often linked to the jerking exercise that um, Stone refers to as the barking exercise. Now, he describes it as the barking exercise was often in conjunction with the jerks. A person jerking back and forth made out a grunting or barking noise from the suddenness of the jerks. Uh, I had a professor once back in Cincinnati once relay the tale that often at these camp meetings that they would have altar calls at a wooden altar. And that people experiencing this barking exercise would actually find themselves barking at or up a tree. And this would lead to the somewhat humorous observation that a person was barking up the wrong tree, meaning that they should go to the altar and confess their sins, as opposed to having this barking exercise that is causing them to act rather strangely now, I'd like to point out that the barking exercise, like the jerking exercise, has no proclamation and does not seem to have a New Testament parallel. So, of the things we've looked at so far, the jerking and the barking exercise seem to have the least grounds for being a biblical model of a staticism, simply because there is no proclamation, at least with those two exercises, and there is no um, actual precedent for it in Scripture. Now, these last three exercises are somewhat more tricky. Uh, this fourth one we're going to look at is called the singing exercise, and Stone will describe it as, the singing exercise was a melodious song, uttered not from the mouth or the nose, but from the chest. 
my guess is from that description, it sounds like ventriloquism. But Stone would then go on to further say, those who heard it concluded it was the most unusual and unnatural. And Stone himself said, it was more unaccountable than anything else I ever saw. So basically, of the things we're looking at here that happened at Cane Ridge, the singing exercise was the one exercise that really made Stone just kind of shrug his shoulders and say, I don't know. I don't know where this is coming from. So of the six exercises that Stone described, this one seems to have most profoundly influenced them to say there's something unnatural that humans just don't naturally do that. Again, this one doesn't have a proclamation per se that these, this melodious song doesn't say anything about its lyrical content. Now, Pentecostals have been really quick to jump on claiming this one, though. And they'll be also very quick to point out Ephesians 5.19 and Colossians 3.16. Both of these texts encourage a person to sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. And in this case, Pentecostals will look at this singing exercise and possibly suggest that this melodious song, which may have no lyrical content at all, is this manifestation of this third category, a spiritual song. So, the singing exercise falls into the no discernible proclamation, so can't run it through the John Moses test, and only possible New Testament parallel, meaning that the Pentecostal groups are very quick to say that it has a parallel. Most of the rest of church history would define, though, the spiritual song as based on its lyrical content. And again, as far as Stone uh, was able to record, we don't have any examples of lyrical content from this singing exercise. Now, this fifth one, a lot of people may classify with the jerking exercise. Uh, the dancing exercise, um, Stone describes, usually began with jerking and eventually slowed down into a dance that could be either fast or slow. And Stone also notes that it did not cause others to be amused, i.e. that people didn't laugh at people who did this. Instead, it appeared to be a heavenly motion to according to those who saw it. Now again, no proclamation, so we can't hold it up to the John exercise. But, anyone familiar with the Old Testament would certainly know um, King David bringing the ark into the, uh, into the temple area, or into Jerusalem, sorry. Or, after the flooding of the Red Sea, uh, Moses' sister will lead the Israelite women in a dance. Um, and so dancing, even exuberant dancing, does have New Test or sorry, does have Old Testament parallel. And so again, like the singing exercise, this could be a possibility of at least we have some example from Scripture that says that this isn't just totally in left field. And finally, we have the laughing exercise. Now, Stone's description is that similarly, the laughing exercise did not cause others to laugh, i.e., again, people aren't laughing at people or making fun of people having the laughing exercise. But Stone would call it a loud and hearty laugh, but rapturously solemn at the same time. Again, he's describing it in very paradoxical terms. And it is difficult to imagine such a solemn laugh. And one understands this to be a problem, and of course, Stone calls it just truly indescribable. Now, the laughing exercise, in my opinion, falls into the barking and jerking exercise. We really don't see a clear-cut example in the New Testament of this uh, exercise. And, um, again, it is not accompanied by proclamation. And so, again, this laughing exercise, like the barks and like the jerking, seemed to come kind of out of left field. So, let's kind of conclude here. Because the Cane Ridge Revival is so unique, 
and it was so large. It's difficult to say exactly what happened that August in 1801. There's really three interpretations that, it ex that exist here. One, that this was kind of a pre-Pentecostalism, and that people who take this view won't necessarily call it Pentecostal because, of course, what is one of the major things not described by Stone is speaking in tongues. But just let the record show that people who are quick to claim these events, these things that happen at Cane Ridge, as being a sign from God, are very quick to call it kind of a prelude to Pentecostalism. Now, of course, the opposite theory is, how do we know it's not demonic? How do we know that this does not have some kind of demon or some other kind of supernatural power not from God at its source? And, of course, in modern times, we also have a third possibility. And, again, I point out that sports teams the world over experience we'll call them human-inspired ecstasy, that a person can get so pumped up that they have a ecstatic experience, or they get in the zone. And they can do some pretty spectacular things while this is happening. So, just to offer a critique, let us look at it first from a biblical standpoint. From the biblical standpoint of the six exercises described, only one of them could be tested for its proclamation message. And in that regard, I'll give it a B minus, meaning that people came to, and they did encourage people to do very biblical things. They said that they loved Jesus, Jesus loved them, and that people should repent. Again, all three of those categories have a New Testament precedent. But it is far from the complete gospel. As John was eager to say, are we proclaiming Jesus as the Christ, or as King, or as Messiah? And likewise, are we also proclaiming that he has a body? Are we affirming this idea that he is both 100% God, 100% man, to phrase it in the way of the Trinitarian formula? And all of this is to say that if you do want to hold on to it from being a Christian or specifically a God-given event, it doesn't have a lot of parallels. It has a few, but not enough to make a strong connection of everything we see has these people were reading their Bible and trying to live it accordingly. Now, if you want to favor the demonic influence, well, let's be honest, some other unsavory things did happen at Cane Ridge. Probably the most notorious was that several unwed women ended up getting pregnant. Now, again, you put 30,000 people in a small area, and you have that go on for several days, especially days where it's raining on several of those days, you may have, well, people going to do what people are going to do. And so, while that's not necessarily an indication of the demonic, it is certainly an indication that not everyone who came here came with the intentions of having a wholesome Ten Commandments honoring time. But, if you want to take the human-inspired ecstasy point of view, well, let's look at some of the possible just physical factors. This happened in late August, a r routinely hot month of the year. For the most part, men and women are going to be dressing in quite a lot of clothing. They will have long shirts, long pants, jackets, big frilly skirts. Add to that that it rained several times, that these outfits may be getting wet. In all likelihood, they are made of wool, which means that they will stay damp for a while. Add to that damp, wet, hot, humid, 
add all of that into a pot and stir. And then you add to that that this event lasted for well over seven days. That it supposedly had preaching 24-7, non-stop. A person could very easily work themselves into a frenzy or just could work themselves into dehydration. And so, at the end of the day, Cane Ridge is extremely difficult to nail down what happened. And again, these are your three options. It's either pre-Pentecostalism, demonic influence, or human-inspired ecstasy. And from the historian's point of view, all three can make a genuinely strong case that it is one of these three and not the other two. So let us finish by just noting some of the pros and the cons of the Cane Ridge event. On the pros side, the revival was genuinely ecumenical. At this revival, we had Presbyterians, Baptists, and Methodists, and they all managed to preach and work together. It's the whole sum total was about 40 total ministers in all. And I'd just like to point out that in the early 1800s, getting an event this big from so many different denominations and actually having their clergy work together, well, that may be nothing short of an act of God. <laughs> I'd also like to point out that this experience of religion gave a lot of these people a profound understanding that God was moving in their midst and that God could use them personally. Many people who came to these revivals, especially Cane Ridge, will leave, to use our modern term, on fire for Christ. And the numbers of people that will go back into church are going to skyrocket. Most of the estimates that you can read in the literature will usually say that before the 1801 revival, we have approximately 10 to 15 percent of the people in Kentucky in church. After this event, that number is going to be in the high 80s or 90s. And so all of this is to say that this experience communicated very strongly to the people there that Christianity was a religion that did something. And that these experiences made them a part of whatever it was that God was doing. So, again, three pros on this side. It's ecumenical. The experience gives them a profound understanding that God was in their midst. And church attendance will skyrocket all over Kentucky, southern Ohio, and Tennessee. But there are some cons to this as well. Number one, not everything that does happen at the Cane Ridge Revival is religious. Many of these people will come for entertainment. Many will come from just a break in the monotony of secluded frontier life. It's the biggest thing happening in Kentucky, and it's in the middle of a month when I got very little to do. Why wouldn't several thousand people come all over the place? And once that many people are there and word starts spreading... Why not go see the hubbub? So, in general, the, one of the biggest critiques of this is going to be that people did not come here necessarily for religious reasons, and that they may have stayed more for the entertainment value than for the actual religion being preached. Now, another charge that's kind of closely related to that is that there will be a charge that these revivals are using what's called fanaticism. Or as we've been looking at this whole lecture, ecstaticism. And that they're using this ecstatic experience to encourage a conversion experience. Now, anyone from a Calvinist background, which will be our Presbyterians and our Methodists at this event, that this goes against at least a doctrine of hyper-Calvinism. That in Calvinism, the limited atonement would say that Christ only dies for the elect. And you can't just go around encouraging everybody to have a conversion experience because Christ didn't die for everyone. He only died for the elect. 
Now, a third con of this whole thing is that um, these religious experiences are highly, highly subjective. There's really no way at the end of the day to say that was the Holy Spirit, that wasn't the Holy Spirit. As we've looked at, we've tried to say whether they were biblical in one sense of the word, but at the end of the day, can we know this sort of thing? Especially as historians, when we look at this event from so many, so many centuries later, can we really look back and say, well, that was the Holy Spirit or that wasn't? Again, it is not my job to convince you one way or the other, but simply to lay the facts out and let you decide for yourself. But I know for me, I do think the pro side here is outweighing the con side. That whatever happened at this Cane Ridge revival, it made people in Kentucky take Christianity more seriously than they did. And at the end of the day, I think I'll take that, even if we got there by some really weird or ridiculous means.